to kick off our high level lecture series. Normally it will be a lunch lecture series. So you will see us back in uh, Brussels for lunch lectures, but this evening is a special occasion. It's an evening lecture. I'm very happy to uh, introduce to the lecture Professor Bill uh, Shabas. Now, introducing Professor Bill Shabas is a little bit of a uh, challenge because he is a world renowned um, authority in the area of international criminal law and international human rights law. They say sometimes in sommité, and that's really the case here. But um, Professor Bill Shabas is also really uh, very special because he um, is somebody with not just a great academic CV but also a very distinguished uh, CV in terms of being a, a practitioner. Let me just say first of all that uh, when uh, you want to have a good impression of Professor Bill Shabas, you should read his CV of 37 pages, which, um, and then I speak about small print and two columns on the pages to include all of his uh, publications. He has more than, uh, say, uh, 400 articles, uh, he has published tens and tens of books, edited volumes, uh, and so on. And it's very, I think, characteristic for him that he has two um, proverbs on his CV. One is the following one, happy is the man who can make a living by his hobby. And that comes from George Bernard Shaw. And that is really typifying Professor Shabas. He is just somebody who likes to read, to think, to write, to research, and to talk about it. And as you will see, he's an excellent uh, a speaker. Um, he's also the person who really likes to do research, sitting on his laptop, including all the incredible resources, sources from libraries, uh, from the internet, from archives, as he has done for his uh, very recent book, and who basically writes all of these beautiful articles at the most impossible places, starting with the kitchen table to airports, trains, and I guess many other unusual locations. And that, has, uh, that links together with the other um, uh, proverb that is on his um, CV. It's in Latin and it says, Nulla dies sine linea. In other words, no single day passes without writing a line. It comes from Pliny the Elder and a number of other authors more recently, also uh, uh, Sartre. And I would be inclined to say that this quote, Nulla, Nulla dies sine linea, is a bit too modest for him because I should rather say it's something like nulla dies sine articulum or like uh, nullum a, nullus anus sine liberum because if you see how many articles and books he has uh, authored it's just very amazing. Now let me quickly then say a few things about his bio. He is professor of international law at Middlesex University in London. Is where he's, uh, uh, teaching international and uh, human rights law. He's also professor of international human um, rights and criminal law at Leiden University. He's a distinguished visiting faculty at Sciences Po in Paris and a honorary chairman of the Irish Centre for Human Rights in Galway, uh, Ireland, where he has been uh, leading the uh, National Centre for Human Rights for many, many years. Professor Shabas has dual citizenship. He is uh, both Canadian and um, an Irish uh, citizen. So he is a EU uh, citizen. And um, he um, has studied in, uh, in, in Canada at the University of Toronto. Um, he has also a number of honorary doctorates. And um, on the practical side, apart from his many academic achievements, which, which as I said, includes all these um, very interesting books such as the International Criminal Court, the European Convention on Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a book on the war crimes uh, tribunals, a very classical book on genocide in international law, already many um, editions, and a very classical book as well on the death penalty, the abolition of the death penalty in uh, international law, books which have been translated in many, many languages. But apart from being a, a very prolific uh, academic writer, Professor Shebas is also a, a very seasoned practitioner. He started his career in Canada still as an investigator at the Quebec Human Rights Commission in the early 1990s. He became a lawyer and legal counsel and expert witness in litigation be before various international courts, the International Court of Justice, 
the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American uh, Commission and Court of Human Rights. He has also done, um, say, expert witness um, and counseling work for the International Criminal Courts uh, and so on. And then, in the beginning of this millennium, he has also been for a number of years a member of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Sierra Leone, which must have been a very special experience because, as you know, uh, in parallel with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there was also an international court. There was an, uh, a, um, an, an international criminal tribunal for uh, Sierra Leone uh, as well. And last but not least, he has been chairman of the International Commission of Inquiry for uh, crimes committed in the occupied Palestinian uh, territories. So, a very distinguished uh, practical, uh, um, say, record, track record as well. So, we're really delighted that uh, Professor Shebas is with us uh, this evening. And I think it's high time I give him the floor. His lecture will take stock of the fundamental contribution which international courts and institutions such as the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court um, and regional courts such as our Strasbourg-based European Court of Human Rights, the contribution which those courts make to the rule of law, but also the challenges that these institutions currently face in our very turbulent uh, times. There are indeed a number of states which are leaving the international judicial framework or which refuse to uh, comply with judicial decisions uh, and certain treaty uh, obligations. And so, in that kind of time context, uh, the question uh, for us also from the Reconnect point of view arises, what can and should the European Union do in this type of international uh, context? The EU is well known as being a staunch supporter of the international judiciary and the rule of law. Uh, but when it comes to international rule of law backsliding, uh, what should the European do, both with regard to problems within its membership and in its relations with the wider world? This is exactly the question which we very much would like uh, to listen to what Professor Shebas has to tell to us. So, Professor Shebas, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Walters. I'm delighted to be here in uh, Belgium. I thank you very much for mentioning my um, European connection. Uh, I actually have uh, roots here. My grandparents, all four of them, uh, come from Europe. They were born in Europe and uh, left for North America, all of them before the First World War, in fact. And I always thought, that the first time I came back to Europe, how interesting it was to, in a way, return to my uh, ancestry. I didn't really have the chance for many years to do it in a, in a permanent sense, because I lived in, in Canada, practiced law there, lectured at university there. And then in uh, the year 1999, so not quite 20 years ago, I was offered a position in Ireland I remember friends of mine telling me then, well, Ireland, it's a small country. It's, you're going to be very isolated. Canada, I have to tell you, it's a large country, as you know, physically, but it's not a huge country in terms of population. And it's dwarfed. It has a big neighbor, as you know. And uh, uh, we had relationships as academics with our neighbor to the south, but we, we lived in our own world, too. And, and uh, when I moved to Ireland, I thought, well, this is interesting. I'm going from a country of 30-odd million. In fact, I was working in uh, French Canada, in Quebec, which is more like seven, six, seven million. And I come to a country that's even smaller. And within weeks, I realized that I hadn't actually moved to a smaller country, but I'd moved to a, a hugely, a, a much larger country, which was Europe. I remember getting phone calls from Belgium, from Italy, from Austria, from Sweden, colleagues saying, come to this meeting, join this research group. And it was a thrilling experience that I'm still, uh, I've been now almost 20 years in, in Europe. It's my home. I became a, a national uh, of Europe, 
have a European passport. And while I think of my attachment to Ireland, my attachment to Europe is huge. Um, I live in London now, and for that reason, uh, it's really quite heartbreaking what's going on with, uh, with Brexit. Uh, it's a blow to the European Union. There's no doubt about that. Yesterday on the radio in London, I was in a taxi, and I was listening with the taxi driver to people calling in and talking about the EU and about Brexit. And they asked a journalist, a British journalist who was here in Brussels, you know, were, did the European leaders feel that they, were they happy that they got the better of the British in the negotiations? Because that's the general tone in London was that Theresa May didn't do very well and they, she got outsmarted by, um, by the European negotiators. And the journalist said, no, they're really quite sad about it. They don't think it's a wonderful time and they're sorry to see the, the loss of Britain. Uh, from the European Union. It's not finished yet, of course. It's not a done deal and it's a very unpredictable environment. But the European Union, and this is of course part of the, the project here, uh, is, uh, makes a huge contribution in so many ways and to see it weakened by this development is really quite uh, tragic. In Britain, the debate is often about the economy. So we're hearing the business leaders uh, are concerned that the, that the economy will decline and that they'll suffer and profits will go down. And quite frankly, this is not something that interests me very much. Uh, I'm sorry for them that they're losing money, but money will change hands and someone else will make money. It, it's not what gets my, you know, gets my blood flowing. For me, what's so important is this idea that we live in a, large, a larger and larger community with fewer and fewer borders and where we mix together as people in a continent that my grandparents left um, prior to the two terrible wars that tore the continent apart and destroyed much of it, including this country, and that we're in a better, much, much better place, and we have to stay there. We've got to make sure that this survives, and I think that that's, if I have a, a message in my uh, remarks this evening, that's what it is. So I want to reflect a little bit on the, this notion of the rule of law and its connection with Europe, Europe as a defender of the rule of law. When we think of the term rule of law, it has quite ancient origins. I think um, it is deeply rooted in British constitutional uh, law and politics. People often cite the Magna Carta. I was talking not long ago about the Magna Carta and explaining that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which we're about to celebrate, we're about to celebrate its 70th anniversary in a few weeks, is called the Magna Carta of Humanity. And while the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a wonderfully accessible document, anybody can read it, it's short, you could memorize it in a weekend if you had to. Uh, the Magna Carta is uh, impossible to read. It's actually, and when one looks at it, first of all, it's in Latin, which is an obstacle for most of us. But even if you get a translation into a language that you understand, you read it and say, well, what is this all about? Why is everybody so excited? But it's often pointed to as being the first recognition of this notion of the rule of law, which, is, which encompasses a number of important ideas, but of which I think at that time, certainly the most important was, one was that even the king is subject to the courts of the land, that the law applies to everyone. And that, of course, has then filtered down, percolated down through the, through the centuries. It's taken on slum, somewhat different forms, but, but similar ones in other legal systems. And in international law, we start to use this expression, this formulation, rule of law, uh, in the post-Second World War lawmaking period. There's a very, very rich, dynamic phase in lawmaking that takes place starting sometime in 1945 and that goes on for several years. I think the starting point is the Charter of the United Nations, which does not use the expression rule of law. And people often point to the formulation in the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted on the 10th of December 1948, by the United Nations General Assembly, 
without a negative vote, although there were some abstentions, there were eight abstentions, and there were a couple of delegations that weren't in the room when the, when the, when the declaration was adopted. But it is today recognized as being a, being a, a, a very fundamental universal document, and even compared with 20 years ago, when we marked the 50th anniversary, I recall then that there were countries saying, well, cultural relativism, this is a European document, it doesn't really speak to us, it should be revised. I, I don't hear any of that talk now. I think that we have turned the corner on that issue. And so that document is a very, very uh, important one. And it has a, this phrase in its preamble, it's 30 articles long, and then it, has a, it begins with a, with a very poetic preamble. And one of the recitals in the preamble, I'm going to read to you, whereas <laughs> it is essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights shall be protected by the rule of law. Some writers have said this is actually the first uh, appearance of the term. I don't think that's quite accurate. There's actually a reference to the phrase in the preamble to the constitution of, the, of UNESCO, of the United Nations Education, uh, Science and Cultural Organization, and that was adopted in late 1945. I also found a couple of references doing a, um, doing a search through my laptop, which has all these documents, of the um, of the travaux préparatoire, of the preparatory work of the Charter of the United Nations, and the phrase was used a couple of times by the Chinese representative, and the Chinese representative raised it in the context of the discussion of the statute of the International Court of Justice, and pointed out how important an international court of justice was, a court among states, so that we could enhance and protect and ensure the rule of law among nations. So it's interesting that at this early period we have really prior even to the recognition in the Universal Declaration, this notion of the rule of law applicable at the international level. They're talking about an international law, rule of law that would apply amongst states, states amongst themselves, and that's why we need this great court, the International Court of Justice a court which is located in The Hague, which began its activities in 1946, which has never been busier. You can go on the website of the court and you will see it has never, never been busier. It went through an exciting phase early in its life, I think perhaps due to the fact that it, it rendered a very, very um, exciting and, and compelling judgment in the famous Corfu Channel case, where it ruled, amongst other things, it ruled against the United Kingdom on a question of the use of force, where it said that the United Kingdom had violated the international law prohibition on the rule of force. And I think that uh, enhanced greatly its credibility in the world, which it, it retained for the next couple of decades until a miserable judgment dealing with Southwest Africa, where it appeared to side with the apartheid regime. And then it had no work for another 20 years. Nothing happened really at the International Court of Justice until 1985, until a case known as Nicaragua versus the United States. And the applicant, Nicaragua, won that case. And everybody came back to the court and said, well, now that's a real court, that's an interesting one. So every few decades, the court has to make a ruling against a powerful permanent member of the Security Council and it starts to thrive. And today it's never, it's, it's thriving in a manner that has never before been the case. That's a good sign, that's a very positive one. The national rule of law, this is what we get from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's saying that we need human rights to be protected by the rule of law so that man will not be uh, compelled as a last resort to rebellion against, uh, against um, uh, tyranny and oppression. So that's a message about the relationship between ourselves and our government. It's about the national application of the rule of law. We find the phrase, again, rule of law, in the European Convention on Human Rights. The European Convention is 
adopted in 1950. And as it says in its preamble, it's there to give expression uh, and to enhance the implementation of some of the rights that are in the, um, in the, um, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the uh, English version, as I say, we use the word, we use the expression rule of law. The French is a little uh, less, uh, I think, elegant, the French version of the Universal Declaration. The English version refers to the rule of law, that human rights shall be protected by the rule of law. And the French version talks about human rights being protected by un régime de droit. I, I think it was probably just an inexpert translation, because we know that in French that we have other formulations. L'état de droit is the one that's most commonly referred to. And in the Europe, and, and let me point out, it's interesting as well, in the, in the uh, English version of the Universal Declaration, we use a definite article, the rule of law, uh, whereas in the French version, it's un régime de droit. Um, the English version earlier, had the, an early version, had referred to a rule of law. Uh, and the British delegates corrected that and said, no, it has to say the rule of law. And somehow the French didn't get caught up. In the European Convention, uh, the formulation rule of law is rendered in French as préeminence de droit, which I think is much closer to the, to the, to the meaning and, and uh, more, more accurate. This uh, internal dimension, this domestic or national dimension of the rule of law has been extremely uh, important and central for the uh, institutions that are there to monitor and uh, protect human rights. There are, of course, institutions that have mainly a monitoring role, but as my talk, uh, as the title of the talk made clear, um, the purpose is also to focus on the uh, judicial institutions, the courts which are there and which are available to ourselves as persons subject to the jurisdiction of the European Convention on Human Rights, of the European Charter, of fundamental rights of the applicable law here, um, there are institutions and courts that we have recourse to in order to ensure that we are protected from the rule of law. And those courts are busy. Professor Wouters referred earlier to the issue of the issues raised by the challenges to judicial independence and impartiality in uh, Poland and in Hungary. And there we uh, can be confident that it's getting the attention of the European Court of Justice. There was a recent ruling that is a contribution to that debate and I expect there will be more in the future. Whether that will be enough is another question, but we should be, um, we should be um, pleased that there are institutions to do this work. At the European Court of Human Rights, it has a long history, very early in its history, it, uh, it relied upon that expression rule of law in one of its great historic landmark cases. When I first studied European human rights law, and this is going back many years, as you can probably guess, uh, we only had a handful of decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. There were perhaps 50 or 75 judgments. Now there are about 50 or 75 every month, but I'm talking in the first 20 years of the court, maybe they got to 100 judgments. So we knew every one of them, or most of them, and one of the great ones uh, was a judgment against the United Kingdom uh, Golder versus the United Kingdom had dealt with prisoners. And, uh, and in Golder, uh, Golder was arguing that he had a right of access to a court, that Article 6 of the European Convention, which appears to be uh, a guarantee of procedural rights before a court, that implicit in that right of Article 6 of the European Convention was also the right of access to a court. And he didn't have access to the court uh, there as a prisoner. And he said, well, I should have access to the court because, of the, because Article 6 implicitly includes the rule of law. And the rule of law means you have to have a court. And the British government argued before the European Court of Human Rights that actually this was just kind of a rhetorical uh, 
reference the rule of law in the preamble and that it wasn't uh, significant and that it didn't change the content of the convention. But the court took the view that the reference to the rule of law enriched uh, Article 6 of the convention, that it was there for the, um, uh, it, it was, it, it assisted in understanding the object and purpose of the European Convention on Human Rights, that this was relevant for the interpretation under the principles in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And since then, the European Court of Human Rights has played a huge uh, role in the enforcement of the rule of law, uh, in the examination of problems dealing with elections, with fundamental freedoms, uh, and with access to the courts, uh, with the independence and impartiality of the judiciary. One could write several books, many books have been written about this, about the work of the European Court of Human Rights um, in the uh, protection and enforcement of the rule of law. Uh, I can go beyond Europe, of course, and talk about other uh, bodies that are important in this respect. Again, a huge system, none of which existed in 1948 when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted, of treaty bodies, the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism of the Human Rights Council, and all of these uh, institutions, in one way or another, are holding states accountable and questioning them uh, in a way that was never before done in the history, in history. And this, I think, uh, we sometimes lose sight of, and it's uh, of great significance. Now, I want to touch on a few of the issues relating to the rule of law and how it's uh, understood. I'd like to go back, uh, Professor Rogers referred to my, uh, I, I think my recent book, it's, it's there on the table at the back and if anybody's interested in getting a copy I can sign it for you when the, when the talk is over. I have a few left um, there. It's very reasonable, 20 euro for a nice hardcover book from Oxford with glossy photographs and, and everything. Okay, I've done my little plug for my, for my, uh, for my book project. Um, it, it brought me into very close contact with a number of dimensions of our history, of our history here in Europe, of the history of Belgium, of the history of international organizations, of the history of international justice. The book is about the attempts after the First World War to bring the fallen German emperor to justice. And amongst the charges that they were contemplating um, uh, proceeding against him with was the charge of launching an aggressive war. The war that began when the, when the German troops crossed the border into Belgium uh, in, in early August of 1914 was, I think by most accounts in 1914, still lawful under international law. There was a particular problem here in that Germany was a party to a treaty that guaranteed the neutrality of Belgium, a treaty that dated back to, the, to 1839. But absent a treaty protecting a country, uh, for example, the quarrel between Austria and Serbia about the killing of the Archduke, the general view was that, well, if Austria didn't get satisfaction from Serbia, they could declare war and attack. Serbia, that's what countries did in those days. That was the standard. But by the time the terrible war was over, there was a thirst for justice. Uh, it's very hard for us to imagine today, 100 years later, how terribly people suffered, the loss of life, um, an entire generation of young men uh, decimated by the, in, here in Western Europe by the war. And they turned to, they said, we're gonna, we're gonna prosecute this guy. And the question was, could they charge him with a crime of starting the war? Eventually, that will be done at Nuremberg in 1945 and 1946. But there were big debates at the Paris Peace Conference about whether or not this violated the principle of legality, which is, if not a direct component of the rule of law, a corollary of the rule of law. 
And that led to another issue, which I think is interesting to reflect upon. Had they had a trial, which they planned to do, yeah, that was the original plan, they were going to try Kaiser Wilhelm for doing that, his lawyers would probably have raised an issue about the legality of the charge. And they would have said, but you can't do this. This is retroactive criminal prosecution. And the question that, I mean, there are many questions that are raised by that, but the one that intrigues me here in its relationship to the rule of law is whether or not a court would be able to entertain that question. This is a problem that we now today think about in, in terms of, there's an expression in French, la compétence de la compétence, a German uh, term that's used, compétent, compétent, and it has been and it continues to vex tribunals, especially international <laughs> tribunals, and in particular international criminal tribunals. At the time, we're talking about a court that would have been created by treaty, and so it's an interesting issue about whether the judges had the power to do it. When it arose at Nuremberg, where they had a real trial, the defendants, even before the, the actual hearings began in November of 1945, <laughs> submitted a motion to the International Military Tribunal, the Nuremberg Tribunal, saying, this is unlawful. You can't do it because the crime of starting the aggressive war in 1939 wasn't a crime. And they developed arguments for this. Apparently, they were being helped in the background by, the, by Carl Schmitt, the Nazi jurist. He was providing them with debates and information and arguments. And they submitted the motion. And the court uh, summarily dismissed it and said, we don't have the authority to look at that question. We're not sitting here, as a, we're not sitting here in judgment of our own founding instrument. The, um, the judgment itself addressed the question. The judges said it was raised by the defendants. We don't have to address it. They don't have a right to raise the question. But we feel it's important to answer it. Or we feel it's important to address it. And in the final judgment of the International Military Tribunal, issued on the 30th of September and the 1st of October in 1946, there are a number of pages that, that confront this issue um, and argue, but, but not for the defendants, for the, for the public, for public opinion, that actually it is legitimate and lawful to hold the, some of the German leaders accountable for the crime of starting the war. And that today is, of course, recognized as, as authoritative, even though we still occasionally have academic debates about whether that was correct at the time and whether or not it was fair. But this issue has returned again, and it's taken on a slightly different dimension before the modern day international criminal tribunals. Because questioning issues relating to the legality of the um, establishment of the court also raises issues about the ability of a court to challenge its creator. And in the modern period, the creator has often been the Security Council of the United Nations. And so this brings us to an issue of rule of law at the international level, not in terms of the relationship between two countries, but in terms of the relationship with international organizations like the United Nations. And are those bodies subject to a rule of law? Can they create a court or a tribunal that may be contrary <laughs> to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, or to the Human Rights Treaties? And this issue arose in the first hearings before the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which was created by the United Nations Security Council in May of 1993. The decision, some of you may know it, it's a, it's a, a, a landmark uh, ruling, it's the jurisdictional decision in the Tadic case to October 1995. And there, the, the International Criminal Tribunal, designated by the Security Council, pursuant to a resolution of the Security Council, questions whether they actually have the authority to examine the decision, the legality of the decision by the United Nations Security Council. In the end, they agree that it's okay. They, they don't criticize it. We wonder what would have happened if the contrary uh, 
were the case, I suspect the Security Council would have had a meeting, would have fired all the judges and hired five new ones to render the proper decision in the case. That same issue has arisen before other tribunals. So I think most recently there's a decision of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, which is the fourth of the international ad hoc tribunals. And there the judges have taken the position that we can't question the Security Council. And they looked at this and they basically disputed, disagreed with what the judges of the appeals chamber at the Yugoslavia tribunal had said in the 1995 decision. I think the decision of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon is 2011. Behind that, though, is this broader question of judicial uh, review or judicial consideration of Security Council resolutions. And I think it goes in some way to the heart of our problems of international rule of law. We won't live in a country where the lawmaker is not subject to the courts and where ultimately it's not possible for judges to decide whether laws that are adopted are consistent with the Constitution or with fundamental principles or with international law rules. But we have a global system that resembles the national legal system in some respects, the international legal system and the institutions, and we have a lawmaking component of it, the United Nations Security Council, and the question is, can a court decide that the Security Council has gone beyond its authority or beyond its power? And I guess that question is still, to some extent, unresolved. There have been attempts, there's been profound dissatisfaction within the uh, courts, within the public, about measures taken by the Security Council, particularly um, with regard to measures of counterterrorism. The Security Council, starting now almost 20 years ago, I think, has, a, has, has enacted um, travel bans, blacklists, asset freezes on people suspected of being a terrorist. Now, if you lived in a country where your government, where you went to the bank one day to withdraw money because you were going on a trip and the government, the bank refused to hand you over your bank account, and when you got to the airport, the airline refused to sell you a ticket, and you said, well, what's that for? And they said, well, the government told us, and you, you could go to court. You could challenge that. You could prove maybe that they had the wrong person or something else. But not at the Security Council. The Security Council prepares a list, and this happened to people. They would show up at the airport, pull out the credit card, and the, and the person at the airport would say, well, your, your credit card is frozen. It doesn't work. And, and you can't buy a ticket anyway. We're not allowed to sell you a ticket to fly out of the country because there's a travel ban, and it comes from New York, from the UN Security Council. And someone like that might go to a lawyer, and the lawyer would try to challenge this in court, and would find that there was no way forward. Nothing could be done. So this is a, obviously a, was a shocking situation. And it ultimately ended up before a number of our international courts where there were very, very genuine attempts to try and rein in that authority. I, I think that the, the debate is not yet finished, but we've had important judgments. We have from the European Court of Justice, the Cadi decisions uh, of some years ago. We have them also from the European Court of, of Human Rights. And we have one that's actually uh, Said versus Belgium at the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations. So all of them have, in one form or another, had these issues brought before them dealing with the, the reviewability, if you want, of Security Council decisions. That may happen. That that challenge to the monopoly of the Security Council um, presents itself, there are other dimensions to it that present, itself, that present themselves at the international level. And the one that strikes me as perhaps being the most significant uh, relates to the International Criminal Court. And the International Criminal Court, uh, which was created 20 years ago, we've just marked the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Rome Statute, when it was adopted, there was a little placeholder in the statute. It wasn't completed. 
The, I was there at the Rome Conference. I watched the negotiations. I followed them from beginning to end. And I've written too many words about the, about the International Criminal Court. Article 5, uh, paragraph 1 of the statute, as adopted on the 17th of July, 1998, said there were four crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Four crimes. And then the statute went on in Article 6, 7, and 8 to define three of them. The last one didn't get a definition. There was no definition of the crime of aggression. Instead, there was a little placeholder, paragraph 2 of Article 5, that said, we're going to get to that later. Well, we have to get to a definite, we have to agree upon a definition, and we haven't done that yet, of the crime of aggression. But we also have to agree on the modalities of prosecuting the crime of aggression before the International Criminal Court. And there, the problem was that we had objections from, the real issue was that there were a few countries in the world, five of them to be specific, who said, you can't have a court that could that could undertake prosecutions of the crime of aggression on its own. So this is rule of law. Normally, if you have a court, it can prosecute a crime, and it doesn't require a green light from someone. There has to be a court. That's what the European court said in Golder. Got to have access to a court for this. There's, there, there has to be, if you have a proper rule of law, a way that the crime can be prosecuted. But five countries said you can only prosecute it when you get a green light from the United Nations Security Council. So guess what five countries I'm talking about, okay? The five permanent members of the Security Council and their position was, this was impossible. And I remember sitting in the conference, the review conference of the statute, where the matter was being addressed by, uh, where the matter was being debated about filling this hole in the Rome Statute and finally where it was successfully filled and listening to uh, uh, the delegate from the United Kingdom saying, you cannot do this. This is amending indirectly the Charter of the United Nations. This is not possible. You're upsetting the legal order that was created at the end of the Second World War. He harkened back to 1945. It was as if this was a disruption of the international rule of law rather than an affirmation of the international rule of law. But finally, finally, it was agreed at the conference by consensus that it would be possible for the International Criminal Court to proceed with a prosecution for the crime of aggression without a green light or the blessing of the United Nations Security Council. And so when that happened, there was, I think, a, a, it was like a, a shift, a tectonic shift in the global order, it didn't, people didn't tremble in their houses when it happened, but there was a shift. It was indeed a kind of indirect amendment, perhaps, of the Charter of the United Nations. It was a change, and it was a very positive and progressive one for the global international rule of law because it enhanced the idea that our international courts are not, don't have double standards, and that even the king can be brought to justice. That's the message. And uh, uh, when one thinks about it, and this isn't just the question of the uh, crime of aggression, but more generally, one of the features of the International Criminal Court that sets it apart from all of the earlier international criminal tribunals, the one that was proposed for Kaiser Wilhelm that was going to be essentially dictated to Germany by the five victorious powers. Uh, the one that was set up in 1945 for the defeated Germans, again, by the four victorious powers. Smaller countries like Belgium and Canada weren't invited to the, to the party. We weren't in really directly involved in that. That was the four great powers, four fifths, 80% of the future Security Council permanent members of the Security Council. And uh, so that, uh, uh, that, those were the creators of international justice until the International Criminal Court. And with the International Criminal Court, we have an institution that's closer 
to what a truly independent and impartial tribunal is, and one that ensures that even the king can be brought to justice. Now, I want to speak, I guess I'm getting towards the, another 45 minutes or so? No, don't worry. Uh, I have one sort of final, a couple more ideas, and, and then I will uh, conclude, and you'll be welcome to ask questions or, or express opinions and discuss this um, if you would like. Let me go back to 1914 again, to the beginning of the First World War, uh, the, 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 the day when Germany invaded Belgium, um, violating a treaty that bound Germany. You know, we have a rule, we use a Latin expression, Jan used some Latin earlier, took it off my CV, pacta sunt servanda, it's an expression that's used in, by international lawyers, but I think it's also very familiar to civil lawyers generally, pacta sunt servanda. You, you have to respect a contract. You're bound by a contract, you have to respect it. And that's an idea that's, uh, deeply entrenched, of course, in international law, and I think is also an element and a very important one of the international rule of law. We don't always go to court. These things aren't always settled and enforced by courts. Um, and a very important part of the rule of law internationally is insisting with states that we don't need to go to court because you made a treaty, you agreed to a treaty, and you have to respect it. Bethmann Hallweg, uh, the German chancellor, stood up in the Reichstag after the invasion began and he said, basically he said, well, I'm sorry about invading little Belgium, but we didn't really have much chance because France was too well fortified on the other border, the border with Germany, so we had to come through Belgium and sorry about it, we'll make it up to you after, which I don't think they entirely did. Um, they did give you, you did take a little piece of territory from them, a small piece, but uh, I, I think that uh, that, that was, did not fully recover. In my research on this, I came across a reference, which I've not been able to further corroborate or explore, that at some point during the war, Germany offered Belgium compensation for violating the treaty and for invading Belgium. And the explanation was that what Germany offered was they would buy the Congo from Belgium at an inflated price. So they would take the Congo from you, but they'd pay you more than it was worth. So that's pretty generous. Apparently it was turned down <laughs> without much discussion and, and, and never did happen. Well, after the war, when they talked about prosecuting Kaiser Wilhelm, besides charging him with starting the war, a war of aggression, there was also the idea that he could be charged for violating treaties, and in particular, the treaty guaranteeing the neutrality of Belgium. Really, the two were bound up closely together because one, they were both two facets, really, of the same thing. Um, the Commission on Responsibilities, which did the, most of the d debating about this proposal, finally decided that it wasn't a good thing to go ahead with, that it wasn't clear that violating a treaty could be a crime, an international crime. And return to that, um, uh, the, when the Treaty of Versailles was being finally drafted, the leaders who basically dismissed the report of the Commission on Responsibilities adopted a clause uh, that called for the trial of Kaiser Wilhelm, Article 227 of the Treaty of Versailles, for, for an, a supreme offense against international morality and the sanctity of treaties the sanctity of treaties. So this is the pacta sunt servanda message. It's the idea that states are bound by treaties. The trial doesn't take place, but the issue returns at Nuremberg. So in the charter of the International Military Tribunal, Article 6 sets out definitions of the crimes. There are three categories of crimes, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes against peace. Crimes against peace, finally, was this idea that it was a crime to launch a war of aggression. And in the definition of crimes against peace, there's a reference to uh, a crime waging a war in violation of treaties. 
It's in, it's in Article 6 of the Charter of the International Military Tribunal. In the judgment, the judges talk about only one treaty. So they don't actually find the defendants guilty of violating particular treaties, like the Treaty of Versailles, for example, or other treaties that were uh, adopted. They refer only to one treaty, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which was the treaty for the renunciation of the resort to force to settle international disputes. And that was more in the spirit of, uh, it's not a crime to violate the Kellogg-Briand Pact, but the Kellogg-Briand Pact justifies the legitimacy of prosecuting the crime of starting the war, of aggressive war. And that principle, of course, is so uh, uh, firmly settled now, um, we don't debate the matter anymore. But that's the, the trace about the violation of treaties. Well, today, and, and Professor Walters referred to it in, when, when he gave a little summary of what I would say today, spoke about that and the, the role of treaties in protecting the international rule of law and the fact that some states are trying to get out of the treaties. Well, Britain is trying to get out of the Treaty of the European Union. It's not as simple as the, some of the idiots who voted for Brexit uh, may have thought at the time. It's proven to be a, an intractable and, and maybe impossible legal maneuver. But they think that, they're, that it's possible. They're trying to get out of the treaty. There, have been, uh, there are other examples. Uh, Professor Walters gave the example of some states trying to withdraw from the International Criminal Court. We have now, we have a few of them who are, have, have succeeded. One of them, Burundi, is out. Um, uh, we have uh, attempts by South Africa and the Gambia that, that then were withdrawn. We have the Philippines that has made a declaration, and I'm not sure wh whether it's technically out yet or not, but it will be out soon if it isn't already out. You give a notice, it's a very straightforward mechanism. You give an order, you wait a year, and you're out. And you know, that's the bad news. The good news is that an, uh, an anticipated wave of states, mainly from Africa, withdrawing from the International Criminal Court has not taken place. I think that's the good news. Two years ago, it looked rather terrifying that the 34 African states that had joined the, the International Criminal Court might withdraw. But they haven't done so, and that's a good thing. When states withdraw from treaties, they weaken the organizations. But the examples I've given you are states attempting to do it in accordance with the treaty. So in a way, it's a weakening of the institution whose purpose is to protect the rule of law. But it's not a defiance of the rule of law as such. You know, there's a famous paragraph in the International Court of Justice decision in the Nicaragua case from uh, 1985, where the, the court uh, pronounces itself on the argument that had been raised that actually, although there was this prohibition on the use of force, that actually a number of states maybe didn't always abide by it. And the court said, well, the fact that there are some violations of a rule doesn't prove that the rule exists. And they also point to something. They say, uh, many of these states, when they violate the rule, claim that they're actually not violating it. In other words, they will say, we see this, there are, for example, cases of aggression, cases of violation of the Charter of the United Nations, but states say, no, 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 we're abiding by the law. When the United States and the United Kingdom invaded Iraq in, 19, in 2003, they said, no, 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 this is pursuant to a Security Council resolution. We're, we're not defying the Charter of the United Nations. We're following it. This is consistent. Now, that was a hard argument to make, hard to pass what I call the straight face test. Could you stand up and say that in a public meeting without breaking out in laughter? I'm not sure. But the court, the International Court of Justice, says the fact that they attempt to justify it under the treaty is actually strengthening the rule in the treaty. And I think that's a useful point. Trump in recent months has denounced some treaties. So he, 
I think threatened to, denounce the NAFTA, the North uh, American Free Trade Agreement, but it was a ploy to renegotiate it, and finally it was renegotiated. But he did it according to the treaty. He also recently denounced the treaty that, to me, uh, it's one of the most sacred uh, manifestations of international law. It's an, it's an ancient treaty. It dates to the middle of the 19th century, the Postal Treaty. We, we don't often think of this, you know, but when you send a postcard here in Brussels to a relative somewhere else, you put a stamp from Belgium on the, on the postcard and drop it in the post box, and somebody in another country is going to deliver that postcard, and they're not going to get paid for it. The money stays in Belgium. Why are they doing that for free? Well, because you're doing it for them too, and there's a treaty that provides for it. A few months ago, Trump denounced the Postal Treaty. He denounced it. But it's provided for in the treaty. And I think the general view is that he's hoping to renegotiate some of the terms of it. So I don't know that that's really an affront to the rule of law. But we have a very interesting and quite unique problem relating to treaty law in the area of human rights. And it goes beyond mere interpretation. The, um, two years ago, two countries, both of them taken over by waves of modern populism, are a great threat to the rule of law here in Europe. One of them is a European country, although not a member of the European Union, but one that may or may not want to be a member at some point. I'm speaking of Turkey and the other, the Philippines, their leaders both announced a couple of years ago that they wanted to restore the death penalty. So Erdogan did it after the attempted coup in uh, two years ago, in the summer two years ago. In fact, he even went a step further. He said he wanted to bring it back to punish those who did the coup. So not only was he bringing it back the death penalty, but bringing it back retroactively, which I think shocks the North Koreans and the Iranians and all of those countries saying, no, you can't, you can't violate that fundamental principle of retroactivity. So he was threatening this. In the Philippines, of course, Duterte announced that he, he, wanted, he has lots of, of, of extrajudicial executions in that country, but he was talking about bringing back the death penalty. Turkey abolished the death penalty, well, at different stages, but certainly with following the, at the time of the Ocalan case, at the, uh, not quite 20 years ago. And the Philippines has, has, has drifted back and forth. It's abolished it once, then returned, then abolished it again, and that's where we are now. But here's the problem with treaty law. You're asking, what's this got to do with treaty law? Both of those states ratified the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This is a treaty that states that are already parties to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is one of the main uh, UN human rights treaties. States can ratify that if they would like to go a step further and internationalize their abolition of capital punishment. And about 90 of them have done so. Belgium's done so. All the European countries have done so. And, uh, but it's not just a European thing, obviously. If there are 90, it's a lot of countries in Asia and Africa and Latin America and here in Europe. Um, there's a problem with, with that treaty. Well, it, obviously, they'll be in violation of the treaty, but they can't denounce it. You see, unlike the Postal Treaty and unlike the North American Free Trade Agreement and unlike the European Convention on Human Rights, by the way, there's no denunciation clause, unlike the International Criminal Court. There's no clause in the uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and there's no clause in the second optional protocol to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that authorizes a state to denounce it. It's like when you get you know, inducted into the mafia. You can't get out. You're in. There's no way out. And it's very clear that that clause is not there and that it was deliberate, that this would be a one-way street. You sign up for the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, you can't get out of it. The same for the second optional protocol. 
One can see this because the first optional protocol to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which creates the remedy before the Human Rights Committee, it has a clause of denunciation, and by the way, one that's been invoked, I think, by, uh, by uh, uh, Jamaica and by Trinidad and Tobago and by Guyana and maybe, maybe one or two other states. And if there was any doubt about it, a state tried to denounce it back in the early 90s, North Korea. North Korea sent, uh, um, uh, uh, sent a declaration to New York, to the depository at the United Nations saying they were angry about something. The committee had said, the Human Rights Committee had said something that didn't please the North Korean government. Why are we surprised? And so North Korea said, we're out, we quit. And they sent the message to New York and the chief uh, legal officer, who was then Hans Karel, a uh, Swedish uh, judge, uh, Hans Karel sent a message back to North Korea saying, you know, normally I'm supposed to circulate this because I'm the depository and I'm supposed to send this to all the state's parties and let them know of your decision. But you're not allowed to do this. It's not possible. You can't do it. Uh, we don't accept it. It's not in the covenant. It's impossible to denounce it. And uh, North Korea uh, reacted, this may surprise you, North Korea and said, oh really? Oh, okay, I guess not. And a few years later, North Korea submitted its periodic report to the Human Rights Committee as if nothing had ever happened. And when uh, the Philippines and when Turkey sent their instruments of ratification to the second optional protocol, they knew this. They knew this. They knew that they couldn't get out of it. And you can be sure that Duterte in the Philippines and Erdogan in Turkey have been told by their lawyers that they can't do this. So this is very uh, unique, I think, in international human rights law, to my knowledge. I can't think of any other comparable situation. It's one thing to have disputes about the interpretation of a norm. We have that all the time. And it's, it's also one of the features we have. We have this at the European Court of Human Rights. Countries that are unhappy about judgments, and so they kind of defy their implementation. So I think Russia and Turkey owe money to people who were, won awards before the court and they're not being paid. And Britain is supposed to give the vote to prisoners, and they won't do it. And Bosnia and Herzegovina is supposed to amend its constitution so that Roma and Jews can run for president. So there are some judgments. There's some pushback. But this is different because this is a treaty and it just says you cannot implement the death penalty and the only way that they can do it is to defy the treaty. I'm sure that Erdogan, when he made his statements, didn't know that. And the same for Duterte. And they know it now. And they're not doing it. I think that's the point. I think that's the rule of law at work. I think that they're making calculations and they're being advised by their advisors and being told that they can't afford to do it. Maybe they think it's a detail, the death penalty. But the problem is that if you, if you violate Pacta Sunt Servanda, all the other countries you're in treaty relationships with are thinking, can we trust them? They don't respect their word. They don't respect their treaties. They're not part of a system that, that follows international law. So watch this space. We're not finished with it, but I mean, I think it's something that is, um, it's, 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 it's unprecedented in international human rights law. Uh, and it may, show, it may show us the fundamental weakness of the treaties, but so far it seems to be proving the opposite, that that treaty is an obstacle even to a demagogic I won't call them dictators, let's just call a demagogic populist leader who wants to set the clock back and can't do it because of treaty law, because of international treaty law. Well, um, I'm going to conclude just with a thought about, about where we're at on this planet and in, on this continent of Europe and in this subcategory of this continent of Europe known as the European Union. Um, there are people who frequently allude to the 1930s, and they say, this is like the 1930s again. And we definitely don't want that to happen. We know what, the, what that brought. 
and we see people with that seem to resemble some of the forces that were out there in the 1930s. But I think there's a fundamental difference between today and the 1930s that makes it unwise to draw too many analogies with it. Because in the 1930s, there was a, a, a weak global institution, the League of Nations. There was a court, the Permanent Court of International Justice. But there was no European Union. There was no Human Rights Committee. There was no European Court of Human Rights. These institutions we have today, there are many of them, but they're at the core we're talking about the United Nations as a global institution. The European Union as a, really for me, it's still an experiment in internationalization, in, in breaking down borders, and I just, that's why Brexit is so tragic. I want it to keep expanding and to keep growing. Obviously, digesting those pieces that they keep absorbing seems to be hard and gets harder maybe over the years. But, but ultimately, I dream of a global union. Maybe we'll take the word Europe off it, but, but some sort of global governance. That's my dream. We're not there yet. We're far from it. But if we can live on a continent of 27 countries that have fought each other for the last three or four hundred years and they can live peacefully and agree on laws and go to courts and knock down borders and have the same currency and all of these things, well why not go from 27 to 45 and then to 75 and then to 100 and so on. So I, that's the future at some point. But the question is are we going to be set back, are we going to be pushed back from this wonderful <laughs> experiment. But we have these institutions, and that's what is protecting us. Those who want to return to the 1930s know that. And that's why they want to attack the institutions. They want to attack. They're attacking the European Union because it stands as an obstacle to those developments. They'll attack the European Court of Human Rights, and we have to defend them. I know that's not perhaps the most useful to, the Euro, to reconnect the project to say to the European Union, defend yourself. <laughs> they knew that, so they didn't need people like myself to say that. But I think it's very important for us to understand that these institutions, uh, flawed as they are, I mean, they're still huge advances, and they were built to protect us from the 1930s repeating themselves. I mean, I love the European Court of Human Rights the European Court of Justice have done a whole lot of marvelous things. I don't always agree with their judgments. They have some controversial ones. It's interesting. Can women wear a full burqa in Brussels or in Paris or something? And you know, you may know that although that decision was settled in favor of the French and the Belgian laws at the European Court of Human Rights, the UN Human Rights Committee a few weeks ago said that was wrong and that you can't have a law like that. But these are details. They're interesting. Can you uh, ban a film? Can you send someone to jail for denying genocide? Issues that are interesting. But the big issue is can we protect our governments and our rule of law from what happened in the 1930s? And so far, the center is holding. Um, Jan asked me, am I optimistic? Well, I can't afford not to be. It has to hold. But so far, it's holding, and uh, we're in a bad storm, and we don't know whether the, whether the seawall and the dikes and all of the protections we built are going to withstand it, but so far they're doing it. That's, that's my take on it. I think I'll stop there, and I'd be very delighted to hear questions or comments from any of you. Thank you very much.
And uh, can we say nowadays the same thing again? Uh, it's not only a problem of individual rights in China, it's more than that to me, because the rule of law includes as well as the law of the sea, for instance, where China didn't take up the arbitration case that was brought in by the Philippines, and unfortunately not pursued by the Philippines. How do you see rule of law in China now? Thank you. Okay. Um. <laughs> I've been engaged with, with China for many years. I was uh, in, under the auspices of the European Commission, the European Union. I was the, um, what, the project leader of, an, of a series of exchanges that were undertaken between European academics and uh, Chinese, mainly Chinese academics. So I've been there many times and tried to follow the developments. Uh, we were very help hopeful now almost 20 years ago, that China was going to ratify the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It has not done so. Um, that China would, uh, would move a number of reforms, some of which I believe have taken place. I think there have been very significant reforms in China on the issue of uh, capital punishment, although it's still uh, probably, almost certainly, is responsible for more executions than the rest of the world combined, um, which is not that big a number anymore. That's the, the good part. Uh, there are only about 20 countries a year conducting executions. So, um, and, and the numbers for a country like the United States have declined very, very, very dramatically and continue to do so. Uh, on the issues of freedom of expression, I mean, we could, we could, we're not going to disagree about the, the huge uh, challenges that are are posed in China and the violations on freedom of expression. Um, so this is a situation that we just push on with the levers that we have. One of the problems with China is that it's not, and this has been a problem for since I became interested in the subject, it is to a large extent outside the important treaty regimes. So it's not a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. On the other hand, and this is one of the other um, important progressive reforms within the United Nations, China now gets caught through the Universal Periodic Review. And so China is, in fact, being held somewhat accountable uh, through the Universal Periodic Review at the Human Rights Council um, and has to, has to present reports on its compliance with various fundamental human rights and, and reports, incidentally, on such issues as the death penalty, where it's interesting, just as evidence, one of the things we get out of the Universal Periodic Review is evidence of, of what states consider to be their human rights obligations in the absence of treaty provisions. So we get that. China reports about the death penalty and about certain norms that it tries to respect. So that's all positive. The reference to China in the, at the, with regard to the international rule of law is uh, you're talking about the South China Sea arbitration, which China boycotted. It did, as governments often do, try to participate indirectly by having academics publish articles in academic journals about its position, so they were well known. Um, and uh, I don't know that uh, China has now uh, totally defied the arbitration. I don't know what its position is, but um, uh, that's, a, that's a sore point, obviously. And uh, uh, the China was, I have a Chinese doctoral student who I thought was going to be rather loyal to his country, but. He read the South China Sea arbitration decision and said, it's logical, it makes sense, it was very convincing. But I don't know where the future lies there. And apparently the Philippines, has, which was the big winner in it, uh, has backed off on it and said they don't care. Um, that's, that's as, I, I don't follow this on a week-to-week -week basis, so I don't know what the latest developments are. My name is Dirk Kuhl, I'm from the Human Rights Center at Ghent University. And my question is, um, I would like to hear your opinion about the relevance of the EU becoming a member of the European Convention on Human Rights. What do you think are the main problems? Why it lasts so long before we make substantial steps in that direction? How will the future bring in this area? Uh, hmm. hmm. I wish I could provide you with a great answer on that question, and I can't. We've been talking about it for how long? At least a decade, maybe more. 
I think, longer. Uh, and it appears, uh, I, I guess, much to our surprise, that the that the court in the judgment, the European Court of Justice, was vetoing or was objecting to um, a formula that would have made that possible. Um, maybe it was always unrealistic to think we could line up the, the uh, it's, it's partly a question of hierarchies and about uh, um, relationships between different organizations and maybe it's maybe in the long run all we'll just have to be satisfied with a uh, uh, harmonious and more or less uh, coherent relationship between the Council of Europe, the, the European Court and the Convention, and the European European Union. Doesn't look to me like that problem is going to be solved or unlocked in any way anytime soon. But I don't know that I can say more about it. Do you have an opinion on this? Can you? Yeah. Well, that, that's that's. I, I think it. My own view is it would be desirable. But uh, it seems to be blocked, and I don't know how to, how to overcome that at this point. And I, I don't think that it's, uh, as I say, desirable, but it doesn't strike me as being something that is, uh, creates an insurmountable, it's not a, a, an insur you know, a terrible blow either. It's, a, it's an unfortunate development, or the, the fact that it's not happening is unfortunate, but it's not as if uh, the consequences are disastrous either. It would probably be better. We have this, I mentioned, we have this problem within international law that people have been writing about for uh, a couple of decades now, this fragmentation issue, whether or not that's a problem or whether I, I'm, I've always been suspicious of the debate and I think that the uh, fragmentation, in many ways having these different institutions strengthens the system, having different uh, approaches. I think actually the fact that the European Court of Human Rights and the Human Rights Committee have different uh, takes on the burqa question in France and indirectly in Belgium. I think it's interesting. I think it's it's probably a good thing to create that and to have that uh, divergence to some extent. The general rule, of course, is that the bodies line up and the likelihood that we're going to have grotesque differences between the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, I don't think it's likely. Sovereign court of a member state, and that is when court 
interact among each other and protect themselves in order to protect international Europe and rule of law. So my question is about how do you, do you see this effectiveness aspect of the last 100 years, especially after the World War II, and whether there are problems, and if so, how do you see how we could improve that? Thank you. I think um, that there's a, one of the great American international lawyers, Oscar Schachter, once made this famous comment that 99% of states respect international law, respect 99% of international law 99% of, of the time. So we have to bear in mind that when we're looking at the litigation dimension of public international law, we're looking at that 1% of the 1%. Where, there's a, where there are problems of compliance or where there's problems, serious and maybe uh, totally legitimate disagreements about the interpretation of a treaty or about the scope of customary international law. Um, we're obviously continuing to struggle to make these institutions more effective. Um, they are, I think, more than they were. We can look at the history of the different international criminal courts, treaty bodies, and so on, and see uh, a progression in, you know, it's, it's not stagnant. It's not as if we're dealing with the same inability to, uh, to operate. There remain some obstacles. I mentioned some of them, the famous uh, decisions against the United Kingdom dealing with the vote of, of prisoners, um, which 15 years after a Hearst, I think, there's still no no progress and there is this defiance, but the United Kingdom would be pretty good on implementing most of the other rulings of the, of the court. And uh, big changes that have been operated in the lives of people, I think of some of the great judgments on equality that have transformed our law. Uh, think of the decisions on, uh, uh, on uh, LGBT, I'm talking about the early ones. Um, Dudgeon, Norris, and uh, Modinos at the European Court of Human Rights established principles that are now pretty universal and that have gone well beyond Europe as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't have a, a formula for how those courts and tribunals would become more effective. Um, I think that the uh, willingness of more and more states to go to the International Court of Justice is a good, a good sign. And um, there are debates as well about such issues. I mean, I think the, the problem of, um, of refoulement in Europe, I don't want to say that it's entirely solved because we're always disagreeing about the specific cases, but this is the issue of um, states being able to send people back to countries where they would be subject to a real risk of, of, uh, of inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And that goes back in European law to, to a judicial creation, finally, a judicial creation, the European Court of Human Rights in 1989 in the Suring decision found that buried somewhere in the European Convention on Human Rights and said, when the British said, but that's extraterritorial application of the convention, and the court said, no, you can't do it. You can't do it but, uh, because, of the, because of the potential, because of the risk, you can't send them back. And so the British abided by the rule. And then they came back with the support of some other European states about a decade later and said, come on, this is extreme. We have to have an exception for terrorists, national security issues. And the European court said, no, no, there's no exception. And now it strikes me that all we argue about with European states, um, I could be wrong on this, there may be some exceptions, but based on the case law, both of the European court and the Human Rights Committee, is whether or not there is a real risk. So fine, that's debatable, and not everybody who goes to the European Court of Human Rights is really subject to a real risk. I once I practiced law, I once did immigration law, and I worked for, for prisoners who wanted to be sent, who were being sent back to countries and they didn't want to go. And we 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 say, but you know, the evidence it doesn't look like this is gonna happen. They didn't want to go back anyway. So so you have that litigation, but I mean I think that issue about once it's clear that there is a risk of torture or of inhuman or degrading treatment or of, the cap or of capital punishment, that one's solved here in, in Europe, I think, except for debates about the facts, which are inevitable and you're going to, 
you're going to have them. So I don't know, you, you referred to the, 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 the length of proceedings. And there I think there are some serious efforts. Uh, bodies like the, uh, like the Human Rights Committee, although perhaps their decisions have less teeth than those of the, of the European Court of Human Rights, nevertheless can react more quickly in some respects because they, they have other mechanisms. They have their uh, uh, concluding observations on reports by states. They can ask for uh, interim reports. And so sometimes they can, they're a little, they have leaner, you know, there are a lot of other mechanisms out there in the human rights world besides litigation that are also important ways of putting pressure on states and, and addressing those problems. It's an interesting point. I, I wish my colleague Laurent Pesch were here because he's a specialist on all those details of the, of the treaty and the, the different mechanisms. Um, but I, I do think it's a very, very, I mean, the, the Pacta Sunt Servanda argument, uh, the treaty argument, is a very potent argument. And it doesn't have to be the way it is, oh, you break the law, we'll see you in court either. I think that the, the argument that the consequences of breaking treaties are that no one will want to make treaties with you again, and you'll become a bit of a pariah. You'll be, you'll, you won't be any, any more part of a community that, that is law-abiding, is, is maybe more, um, more serious than the threat of, of, of litigation. It's like, uh, it's like people in a community obeying the laws of the community, the laws of the state and of the community, um, most of us obey the laws not because we're afraid we're going to be arrested and thrown in jail. We do them because we have to abide by them in order to live with other people. And we need them to respect them with us as well. And so it's that common understanding that does it. And so reminding states of that. And that's why our treaties are important. You know, we have a lot more of them now. That's another part. We have a lot more courts. We have a lot more institutions for the monitoring of international obligations. But we also have a hugely, we have much more in the way of treaty law. I mean, the human rights, the, the, the instruments of human rights, to take one part of this, st start with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And could anyone then have imagined what we would end up with? I think then when they were talking, the big debate was whether they'd, they'd have another, how many treaties would be attached to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as part of the, uh, of the um, uh, International Bill of Rights. When the, European, when the Council of Europe in 1949 began negotiating the text of the European Convention on Human Rights, I mean, it became treaty number five in the European treaty series, and what are we at now? 225, something like that? I don't think anyone imagined it, but most of that stuff, everyone writes, of, I mean, it's, so this is good. The, the law itself, the treaties, even, even if the institutions them, for their enforcement are maybe not as robust as we'd like, there, there are other ways to implement the laws than, and to enforce them than by litigation. Brexit, they will not benefit anymore from 
Zoni of Catholic Justice in Luxembourg. So protected by, by the Catholic Justice vis-a-vis -vis the ruling of the national of the national the ruling of the national courts. And many politicians in the framework of the campaign have said that they would also withdraw from the Strasbourg Convention. Well, there is a law convention signed in Rome, but it's affected is in Strasbourg. They say we'll get rid of all these uh, European uh, institutions. We can live with our national judiciary without interference from the European one. If I understand well, you say they cannot withdraw from the European uh, Human Rights Convention. Yes, uh, this is a good thing. But I would like today to refer to the principle of effectiveness, and also you mentioned Pacta Sub Servanda. All those who still want to withdraw from the Convention, they can invoke the situation has changed internationally. So Pacta not Servanda anymore. And the principle of effectiveness. What about you know, paying contribution, not sending a judge, and totally ignore what the, the institution, the European national, international institution, does? Uh, you cannot do anything because the principle of effectiveness is like that. Unless you don't have a card or to punish state because of not, uh, etc. One uh, a brief question: What about the crime of aggression? Was the EICC was really compiled, was introduced, is, is, is effective anymore. And last question and brief also, the Islamic world say that the principle which were uh, laid down in New York are uh, uh, West principle, they don't fit with that, let's say, tradition, environment, world and principle. Okay. No, there are actually a number of points that, that you've raised in your interesting uh, comment. Um, the first, just to be clear, uh, it is possible to denounce the European Convention on Human Rights. There's a, there's a clause in it that provides, I forget what article, is it 56, 57 in the Convention that allows for the denunciation. It, it's been done once by the Greek colonels in about uh, 1970 and they denounced it, and then they, their lifespan was short, and when they fell three years later, the Greek government uh, immediately uh, rejoined and ratified the, the European Convention. But it is possible uh, to do that, and that issue has come up. Uh, Theresa May, by the way, before she became the Prime Minister, when she was the Home Secretary, and before Brexit, because she was also a Remainer, but she had called for, when she was uh, the Home Secretary, the withdrawal from the European Convention on Human Rights. That was her thing. And uh, about three years ago, she said that she had now reconsidered and that she was not pushing that anymore. But somewhere deep inside her, there was this, this idea that we can get out of it. We can get out of the European Convention yeah, on Human Rights. Well, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the, the European Convention protects not just European citizens, it protects everybody within the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom, within the jurisdiction of the Convention. It has protected uh, citizens in Iraq, for example, who have been successful in challenging Britain at the European Court of Human Rights. So this would be a disaster, but, you know, they, I mean, Turkey could withdraw tomorrow from the European uh, Court of Human Rights, and uh, Russia could withdraw from the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, it's a great question. Why do they join it? Why do people have written about this, of course, and speculated? What is it that makes states join, ratify human rights treaties? Why do they do it? Why do all these states with serious problems, what, what interest do they have in going and reporting every three years or every four years to a committee and being told that they're a disaster? And yet they do it. Last night I was interviewed on the radio on, on Al Jazeera, Arabic. They call me once in a while in London to go on and talk about the elections in Bahrain. Bahrain recently ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and only a week ago the Human Rights Committee issued its first concluding observations about Bahrain. It's terrible Bahrain. Why did they join? I guess they thought there's some dividend for them that somehow they've 
concluded that it's important for them to be part of this international community and they can't sit outside it and just say, well, we're kind of like, you know, I don't even know how many of them, I mean, for the, for the global human rights treaties, we're pretty close to universal ratification for most of them. The, the Racial Discrimination Convention, so I think 189, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is 194 or 95, so it has even a few non-member states. The covenants are about 170, and within that number, you've got about 10 or 15 of these Pacific Island states that are, have a population of 10,000, and they come in the Universal Periodic Review and say, we don't disagree. They say, why don't you ratify the covenant? And they say, well, it's just, we're a little country, you know, and we don't have a big staff, and it's just too complicated to do all that, but we don't disagree with it. So we're pretty close to universal uh, ratification. Of why do they join it for the pain? Why did they vote for the Universal Periodic Review? That was adopted by consensus in the General Assembly, and they have to report even the states that haven't ratified treaties. So China has to report on civil and political rights. They never had to do it before. The United States has to report on economic, social, and cultural rights, and they do it. And, and they could even, you know, in the Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council, it's quite fascinating in this respect, states could say, we don't have to report. The United States could say, we don't have to report about economic, social, and cultural rights. We never agreed with that convention. We never ratified it. And what do they do? They come before the, the Human Rights Council and they report about education, medical care, and housing. And the Chinese come and they talk about the death penalty, as I've said, and they could do the same thing. So there's something about this system, despite everything people say, states don't like it, they don't abide by it, they don't follow the recommendations. Why do they keep joining it? Why do they keep ratifying treaties? There is some benefit that they get out of it, and that's what helps us to move this monster in the right direction. It does keep moving forward somehow, and even the threats right now have not yet stopped it. I, I see Jan's getting restless, and I should, let me just leave you with one final thought, because I, I spoke on a few occasions here about the abolition of capital punishment, which is one of the most marvelous examples of progressive development of human rights law. And I remember after the World Trade Center in 2001 thinking, well, this is going to be bad now. They're going to bring it back. There's going to be an increase of the death penalty, states saying. And there was an increase of many terrible things, detention without trial, torture, inhuman treatment of prisoners, violations of the right to privacy. Many, many things came with that but there was no increase in capital punishment. It kept declining year after year following, uh, the, uh, following September of 2001, including in the United States. The United States, the death penalty is almost not quite at the vanishing point. Last year, fewer than 20 people were executed. And they, that's the lowest number in 25 years in the United States. It just has con continued to decline. Trump could be elected, he could be reelected, he could pack the Supreme Court with his family members. And I think it'll still decline. I don't know why, but it's great. Okay. As you see, we could go on forever with such a, a vital and energetic speaker. And I've seen that some people still wanted to uh, ask a question. I would suggest that we do that uh, while having a drink and some, uh, some food. But let me just very, very quickly um, uh, conclude uh, this, this uh, extremely rich uh, evening where we basically had a kind of crash course in the way in which the international rule of law was constructed in the past century. And I think we, we ought to be grateful to uh, Professor Shebas for reminding us of this important uh, international legal heritage and also of our own responsibility, I think both in Europe and globally, to protect and to nurture uh, that system. And I really appreciated your hopeful and fundamentally optimistic message about that.
So just two points. Um, as Professor Shape has indicated, he is actually here also in Belgium and in the Low Countries on a kind of, what I should say, book tour. Uh, he has published a recent book with Oxford University Press on the trial of the German emperor. And the book is for sale, as you said, at a very, very attractive price. There are not many copies around anymore. And tomorrow evening he's going to give a public lecture about the book at the law faculty of uh, KU Leuven. So, but for those of you who want to have this unique, this pièce unique of a book hardback with all these um, pictures, but also with a personalized signature and dedicate of Professor Shebas, you can still obtain a few copies in the back of uh, the room. And then last but not least, I should actually also invite you already for the next Reconnect high-level lecture, which will be uh, done by one of our very uh, distinguished uh, consortium members. It's uh, Baroness, actually, uh, from the House of Lords, Dr. Julie Smith, who will indeed talk about Brexit. So something that couldn't be more timely, but she has been a very uh, important voice in this whole debate, and she can really situate this in the whole problematic of the Reconnect project uh, as well. So here we are at the end of this beautiful lecture. I think very, very rich, very informative. I hope you all enjoyed it. But now it's high time to exercise our right to food. So let's go for some good drinks and food. Have a good evening.